This is Duke University. So I'm really delighted to introduce Karen Barad, who has a PhD in theoretical particle physics and quantum field theory from SUNY Stony Brook, and is professor of feminist studies, philosophy, and history of consciousness at UC Santa Cruz. She's uh, a perfect fit for this event and also for our special women's studies theme year of feminist science studies. One of the complications about introducing Barad is that if we take her work seriously, like the ambitious field theory that she lays out in Meeting the Universe Halfway, Quantum Physics and the Entanglement of Matter and Meaning, published by Duke University Press, um, <laughs> our ordinary vocabulary becomes problematic. Barad's own proposals should make it difficult, should interfere with, speaking of her location, her chronology, of her as a distinct individual subject moving through linear time and uniform spaces, or make it difficult or interfere with ignoring the making and effects of my own speaking here with you. So to escape this daunting challenge, I'm going to take refuge in the rather unknown text of an 11-year-old, and I really apologize because I, it follows so badly on the previous talk about my maternal position, at least butch maternal position, and <laughs> reinforcing repronormativity. But this week, <laughs> this week when I was a little bit stressed and intimidated by the prospects of introducing Barad's work, my daughter read me a story that she wrote for her elementary school class. In it, the protagonist, Piper, is annoyed with her mother, I mean, that's fiction, clearly, <laughs> uh, and leaves the house with her science notebook in hand. And here I quote, Piper's type of science wasn't your typical boring, no offense, type of science. No, she studied how alike humans were to untamed animals. So then Piper goes downtown, I'll skip that part, and then she says, Piper was glad to see that her favorite object of inspection, Mr. Vanderbilt, was there. He was by far the most impolite, arrogant, conceited, and about a million other things following that line person she'd ever met. So of course Piper loved it. He was the perfect subject for her studies. But he didn't move much. In fact, Piper thought he displayed Newton's first law of motion perfectly. Every object at rest stays at rest until acted on, uh, uh, acted on, um, acted upon by another force, that force was his mother, who would hit him on the back of his head to get him moving. She, Piper thought, was the perfect example of the second part of Newton's first law, that every object in motion stays in motion unless acted upon by another force. For her, the only forces that dared act upon her were friction and gravity. Um, as you see in our household, while we may interrogate the hu animal-human boundary, a boundary that anybody exposed to young children, I think, interrogates, um, <laughs> We seem to remain pretty committed to the utility of Newton's laws, to classi classical mechanics, to a logic associated with the dead white men, Descartes, Galileo, Kepler, and with their concepts of ob objects, cause and effect, and causality. If I know the initial position and velocity, for example, of my daughter's jacket, and I see the force of her arm and the direction, um, taking account into friction and whatever, I know that the jacket will end up on the floor as it always, in fact, does. I mean, what I mean here is that so much of our daily experience in common sense, particularly in secular versions, has integrated classical thinking about distinct bodies and their interaction, interaction, not intraaction, um, with in, in a field of space and a flow of time, and that daily life reinforces, as many of us experience it, this depiction of physical reality. Likewise, as so much critical theory has explained to us, like what, some of what we've already heard and what we've read for today and, and for this workshop, um, much of our sense of politics and ethics rests on a sense of firm ground, on discrete, discrete objects, intentional human actors with agency, and with the sense that there's a knowable truth with reference to some absolute Archimedean point in space and time. As long as this happens in a place that is moving in some regular way, we maybe even can integrate Einstein's general and specific theories of relativity, although for many they still defy common sense. Barad's work offers a signal contribution to feminist science studies through, her unfold, for, through unfolding a view of the operations of the world that would have as, as, at its center, if we could speak of a center, knowing about the world. Measuring is inseparable from the object, the phenomena we measure. Not only information, but concepts are material. They are part of the mattering, the unfolding making of the matter. Barad's work entwines with what, what have been, I think, two main threads of feminist science studies concerning epistemology and life. Analyses of the power-knowledge relation in the authority or mystification bound up 
with science's association with objectivity and knowledge about truth or reality. And then the predominant feminist science studies focus on the life sciences, biology, and medicine. Barrage trajectory links us to physics, the uber domain of physical reality and governing laws. She takes us through theoretical phys physics, particularly the counterintuitive proposals of quantum mechanics. In so doing, her work links epistemology and ontology, construction and reality, animal and human, matter and void, in ways that resonates with and extends the provocations of Donna Haraway and the explorations associated with post-structuralism like Judith Butler and Michel Foucault, but also like the talks we heard earlier and Ranji's introduction. Bar Barad reminds us that she's not offering a social analogy to the physical world. She's not saying that social life is like photons or quarks, or that power works like quanta, or that anything can just be anything. She refutes a common link made between the relativism of time, which depends on the constant of the speed of light, and the sense that cultural values are relative. Barad is not a relativist in this sense. She insists on the necessity of exclusions, of cuts, a necessity that has a relation to what could still be called laws um, and is still often rendered in a classical vocabulary. If we take seriously the quantum mechanical view of the world, which is at once a philosophy and a science, Barad tells us, we need to rethink fundamental classical categories of cause, agency, measuring, subjecthood, identity, not only because of the harm that these categories have fostered, but as I understand it, also because they are actually empirically wrong. But pulling the Newtonian rug out from under us raises many challenges. Um, one challenge might be child rearing. Uh, you know, is there like a quantum guide to parenting? <laughs> I myself use discipline and punishment as my, <laughs> the panopticon, it's what you want. <laughs> so, Barad, <laughs> butch mothering. Um, <laughs> Barad's challenges raise questions for how we think about ethics, politics, and justice. Our established adjudications of justice and ethics rely tacitly, at least, on classical mechanical understanding of bodies in motion, human intention and will, clear space-time locations. And can we adjudicate it all with a set of facts that puts those in relational entangled motion and incorporates theory into matter? How can an ontology predicated on subatomic reality that embeds, phys re embeds ethics into its, re into, into its reality? Or, and how are apparatuses of knowing ethical? Barad's commitment to the material ontological and to being accountable to the cuts one makes reflects, I think, an ethical orientation. And today she's going to push us further into those implications of, quant of a quantum, thinking about a quantum reality with her talk, remembering the future, reconfiguring the past, Temporality, materiality, and justice to come. Well, it's a little bit like having the Indigo Girls would be your warm up. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say uh, how, you know how already intimidating it is to be a keynote among such eminent scholars, but uh, to, be, to have an introduction like that. Uh, I don't know, that was wonderful. Thank you very much. We can talk about butch mothering later. All right. Um, so uh, so I, I, I really am very much honored to be a speaker here at the um, eighth annual Feminist Theory Workshop and I want to thank Ranji for inviting me, and also Kim Carlisle for doing everything to make me comfortable. Um, so my talk today is going to be playful. So this was actually a very playful introduction, and it will be a playful talk. So um, if you get dizzy with slides, uh, you might want to look away for some of it, but it's integral to what I'm doing. OK. So um, in her introduction to the um, GLQ special issue on queer temporalities, Elizabeth Freeman writes, when Shakespeare's Hamlet says the time is out of joint, he describes time as if heterogeneity can be felt in the bones, as a kind of skeletal dislocation. In this metaphor, time has, indeed is, a body. This sensation of asynchrony can be viewed as a queer phenomenon, something felt on, with, or as a body, something experienced as a mode of erotic difference, or even as a means to express or enact ways of being and connecting that have not yet arrived or never will. 
There have been a lot of wonderful writings on temporality of the human subject about various ways that we live time non-linearly. Whereas for the most part, nature is left to exist in clock time, according to time, one time, universal time, rather than to live time and to live it differently, even contingently. My talk today calls this distinction into question. I will be inviting you to go on a journey with me into the world of physics, and I will attempt to do it in a performative mode so that you can not only see how the nature culture binary is being deconstructed through physics, but also perhaps feel it, if not in your bones, maybe by some disorienting proprioceptive effects. <laughs> staying with physics for me is what my friend Donna Haraway calls staying with the trouble. My political commitment is my, in, in my work is to questions of science and justice. And part of that work is deconstructing the science in a Derridian sense, showing ways in which physics, indeed nature, deconstructs itself. This does not mark the downfall of science, of course, but it does enable political possibilities for reworking its unquestioned authority in a way that is epistemologically robust, that is, its radical openness, its indeterminacy as a practice, its ongoing questioning of itself is about the work of reconfiguring science in relation to justice. Matter is not mere stuff. It is not an animate givenness that is in action incarnate. Matter is not in need of some supplement to put it in motion, to enliven it, to give it agency. It is not the absolute other to liveliness. It is not an unresponsive, indifferent, indifferent, stone cold, dispassionate inertness that makes even death look lively. That which isn't even worthy of the grip of death, of pain, pleasure, joy, suffering. It is not an inert canvas for the inscription of culture and meanings, a static thing without memory, history, or an inheritance to call its own. It is not simple, it is not some thereness available for the taking, a mere bare backdrop to what really matters. Matter is substance in its iterative, interactive becoming, not a thing, but a doing, a congealing of agency. It is morphologically active, responsive, generative, articulate, and alive. Mattering is the ongoing differentiating of the world. Matter plays an agentive role in its ongoing materialization. Physical matters, matters of fact, matters of concern, matters of care, matters of justice are not separable. Matter is a matter of transmateriality, a cutting together apart, differentiating entanglements, agential relatings and differences across, among, and between genders, species, spaces, knowledges, sexualities, subjectivities, and temporalities. At stake are questions of being, becoming, knowing, getting along well together, and living well. Today I would like to engage in some imaginative play about one of matter's most intimate doings, its materializing of time. Matter doesn't move in time, matter doesn't evolve in time, matter materializes and enfolds different, different temporalities. Today, I would like to invite you to experience some different sensibilities and sensations, to explore possibilities of new imaginaries of space-time mattering by way of this tale of a tiny bit of matter whose existence is not merely entangled with our own or even one who is an integral a part, of, part of us, but without whom there would be no world as we know it. The electron is at once a particle so tiny that it is without spatial dimension, or rather it is as big as the universe in its entangled specificities. How shall we begin to imagine time together with, uh, with electrons while the synapses of our brains operate through the electron signals they pass in the literalization of the materiality of imagining? Quantum particles unsettle comfortable notions of temporality of the new, the now, presence, absence, progress, tradition, evolution, extinction, stasis, restoration, remediation, return, reversal, universal, 
generation, production, emergence, recursion, iteration, temporary, momentary, biographic, historical, fast, slow, speeding up, intensifying, compressing, pausing, disrupting, rupturing, changing, being, becoming. This is not merely an exercise in metaphysics or even physics. And as I have tried to emphasize in all my work, this is not merely about particles in the micro world. Indeed, there is no micro world versus macro world. Scale, scale of space and time do not pre-exist. Space-time mattering is iteratively reconfigured with each interaction. But electrons and atoms are good to journey with because they are not so easily seduced into the times of linear history, nation, and family. They spark new queer political imaginings that cut across space times. At stake are questions of justice and responsibility. I want to invite you to come on a journey with me to experiment with possibilities of telling different kinds of stories, stories that invite different responses, all the while being attentive to the materiality of imagining. So uh, one point about electron speak before we embark. So I'm going to use some different material practices of pronunciation in order to get at the cross-cutting of dichotomies that will soon become apparent. And so I will say things like discontinuity, meaning dis slash continuity. That is a differentiating entanglement of discontinuity and continuity, a cutting together apart. Now I will begin my talk, but not from the beginning. The beginning has already clearly begun, or rather, the beginning will never arrive. This beginning, like all beginnings, is always already threaded through with anticipation of where it is going, but will never simply reach, and of a past that has yet to come. It is not merely the, that the future and the past are not there and never sit still, but that the present is not simply here now, multiply, heterogeneous iterations all, past, present, and future, not in a relation of linear unfolding, but threaded through one another in a nonlinear enfolding of space-time mattering, a topology that defies any suggestion of a smooth, continuous manifold. It is not only the nature of time and its disjointedness that is at stake, but also disjointedness itself. Indeed, the nature of dis and jointedness, of discontinuity and continuity, of separation and entanglement, and their impossible intrarelationships are at issue. This paper is about joins and disjoins, cutting together apart, not separate consecutive activities, but a single event that is not one, intraaction, not interaction. An experiment. I've attempted to write this paper in a way that disrupts the conventions of historical narrative forms, such as those that underlie stories of scientific progress, tales of the continuous accretion and refinement of scientific knowledge over the course of history, sagas of progress from an earlier time period to a later one, punctuated with discoveries that lead the way out of the swamp of ignorance and uncertainty to the bedrock of solid and certain knowledge. In an effort to disrupt this kind of, not, of, of narrative, and not just this, I aim to provide you, the active listener, with an opportunity to engage in an imaginative journey that is akin to how electrons experience the world. That is, there is a disorienting experience of the disjointedness of time and space, entanglements of here and there, now and then, a ghostly sense of discontinuity a quantum discontinuity, which is never fully discontinuous with continuity or even fully continuous with discontinuity, and in any case, surely not one with itself. There is no overarching sense of temporality, of continuity in place, and no coherent sense of self as assumed as in so many time travel tales. The scenes are neither discontinuous nor continuous with one another or themselves. There is no smooth temporal or spatial topology connecting beginning and end. Each scene diffracts various temporalities. 
iteratively differentiating and tangling within and across the field of space-time mattering. Scenes never rest, but are reconfigured within and are dispersed across and threaded through one another. Multiple entanglements, differences cutting through and replacing one another. My hope is that what comes across in this disjointed movement is a felt sense of difference, of interactivity, of agential separability, differentiatings that cut together apart. That is, the hauntological nature of quantum entanglements. Particles are given to fits, to paroxysms, to spagmatic bouts of emotion or activity. There seemed to be something queer about the quantum from the beginning. Or rather, it became evident from the start that the quantum causes trouble for the very notion of from the beginning. 1912, Niels Bohr proposes the first quantum model of matter, the atom. Bohr's inheritance, the planetary model of the atom, electrons orbiting the nucleus like planets orbit the sun, a debt he owes to his teacher, Ernst Rutherford. The planetary model has drawbacks. An orbiting electron would continuously radiate away its energy, giving off a continuous spectrum of light while it quickly spirals into the nucleus. Atoms wouldn't be stable. No small matter. <laughs> Other inheritances. In 1900, Planck proposes the quantization of energy. Energy is exchanged in discrete packets not continuously. 1905, Einstein proposes that light itself is quantized. He wins the Nobel Prize for his crazy idea of the photon, light quantum, not for relativity. Bohr's idea, the nucleus remains at the atom's center, but electrons don't orbit the nucleus, Pache Rutherford. Rather, each electron resides in one of a finite set of discrete or quantized energy levels, and atoms only emit photons when electrons jump. Every time I say jump or leap, it's a weird thing. You want to hear like woo wong 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 while I'm saying leap. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I tried doing that with sound effects once. It gets to be a bit too much, so I'll trust, <laughs> I trust your imaginings. Okay. So, um, so anyway, so atoms only emit photons when electrons jump from one level to another. <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right. So in particular, when an electron jumps <laughs> from a higher energy state to a lower one, it emits a photon whose color or frequency is determined by the size of the jump, the change in energy. In this way, there is no continuous draining away of the electron's energy and no continuous spectrum of light emitted. With Bohr's model, atoms are stable and each kind of atom emits a unique line spectrum. A tidy little mechanism, a simple causal explanation for the existence of matter that accounts for its spectral qualities. Nice, but not so fast. <laughs> Spectres abound. The very process by which a single line in the atomic spectrum is produced is spooked. Each spectral line is the result of an electron making a quantum leap from a higher energy level to a lower energy one. But what precisely is the nature of this leap? Space-time coordinates, universal time, no time. 1687, Newton's Principia diffracted through 1814, Laplace's demon, the hero of a thought experiment, a clever chap who stops time, gathers information about the whereabouts and instantaneous movements of every particle, making for a complete data set, which then plugged into Newton's equations, gives man his ultimate wish of complete knowability. All time is calculable, laid out the entirety of the past, of all that lays behind us and the entirety of the future, of all that is before us, starting with but one moment, any moment, all moments made equal, all time and no time at all. 
how much of our understanding of the nature of change has been and continues to be caught up in the notion of continuity. For Newton, physicist extraordinaire, inventor of the calculus, author of biblical prophecies, uniter of heaven and earth, continuity was everything. <laughs> It gave him the calculus, and the calculus gave voice to his vision of a deterministic world, placing knowledge of the future and past in its entirety at man's feet. Prediction, retrodiction, time reversal, time universal, man's for the asking. The price, but a slim investment in what is happening in an instant, any instant. Determinism rules. Nature is a clockwork a machine, a wind-up toy, the omniscient one started up at time t equals zero, and then even he lost interest in and abandoned. <laughs> or perhaps remembers now and again and drops in to do a little tuning up. <laughs> the universe is a tidy affair. 1900. Quantum signifies the smallest possible and therefore indivisible unit of a given quantity or quantifiable phenomenon. It is a measure of the discreteness of nature. Unlike many ordinary experiences of jumping or leaping, when an electron makes a quantum leap, it does so in a discontinuous fashion. In particular, the electron is initially at one energy level, and then it is at another without having been anywhere in between. Talk about ghostly matters. A photon of a given color is emitted during a leap that is outside of time. A photon emitted before it reaches where it will have gone at an indeterminate moment after it has left in order to be just the right color. Want me to say that one more time? <laughs> a photon emitted before it reaches where it will have gone at an indeterminate moment after it has left in order to be the right color. A color given by the size of a leap that has not yet happened, that is, as it were, suspended in an indeterminacy, cross-cut by a difference that has not yet been counted. Causality run amok. A quantum leap is a discontinuous movement, and not just any discontinuous movement, but a particularly queer kind that troubles the very dichotomy between discontinuity and continuity. Indeed, quantum discontinuity troubles the very notion of dichotomy, the cutting into two itself. All this quantum weirdness is actually quantum queerness, and I don't simply mean strange. Q is for queer, the undoing of identity. Quantum discontinuity is at the crux of this impossible impassable transformation. On the dark stage under a very dim light, the ghosts dressed in gray, business-like attire keep playing out the events of one night in 1941 when Heisenberg, then working for his home country of Germany, visited Bohr, who was living in occupied Denmark, like the ghosts foretold by the opening question of Hamlet, the ghostly reiterative reenactments of Heisenberg's visit mark the spectral voice of justice. It's quite uncanny. During the early years of the 20th century, evidence came to light that light is, well, it behaves like a particle after all, the position Newton advocated, except when it behaves as a wave, as James Clerk Maxwell, Thomas Young, and others helped to demonstrate convincingly in the 19th century. And matter, it most definitely behaves like a particle. Well, except when it behaves like a wave. <laughs> what nonsense is this? Has science lost its mind, gone mad? Waves and particles are ontologically distinct kinds. Waves are extended disturbances that can overlap and move through one another. Particles are localized entities that occupy a single position in space one moment at a time. Light can't simply just be a wave and a particle, extended and localized, substance and disturbance, a thing and a doing. 
So much for the solid confidence, the assured certainty, the bedrock consistency of silent science at the brink of a new century. It was not merely that new empirical evidence concerning the nature of light seemed to contradict the established view, but during the first quarter of the 20th century, it became increasingly difficult to understand how any consistent understanding of the nature of light could be possible. Desperate to make sense of all this, Bohr makes one of the strangest moves in the history of physics. He turns his attention to the question of language. Entertaining questions that most physicists wouldn't even see as questions, Bohr asks, what do we mean by particle or wave? What are the conditions for the possibility for the meaningful use of these concepts? What is the nature of scientific concepts? What role do they play? How do they matter? Bohr's unique contribution is this. He proposes that we understand concepts to be specific material arrangements of experimental apparatuses. There are no separately determinate individual entities that interact with one another. Rather, the co-constitution of determinately bounded and propertied entities results from their specific interactions. That is, not only concepts, but also boundaries and properties of objects become determinate, not forevermore, but rather as an inseparable part of what Bohr calls a phenomenon, the inseparability, the differentiated indivisibility of object and agencies of observation. Stage left, a ghost of Thomas Young and his famous two-slit experiment, an experiment Thomas Young famously performed but probably never did. <laughs> <clears throat> The two-slit experiment, the grand identity filter, the perfect litmus test of the character of being, the greatest ontological sorting machine of all time. Thomas Young is lecturing. Sound waves from the two speakers set up at the front of the hall form a sonic diffraction pattern so that alternately spaced conic sections of the audience can hear Young's voice with clarity while the others sit with quizzical looks, not hearing a word and still others have their ears plugged because the sound is so loud as to be unbearable. One of these days I'll set this up. <laughs> the words come clearly to those who are well placed. This can be demonstrated using a simple instrument which I call a two-slit apparatus. It's very simple really. It has just three parts, a device that is the source of the entity being tested, a barrier with two holes in it, and a screen placed some distance farther back. Now, if you want to know if an entity is a wave or a particle, you simply fire a bunch of them at the barrier with the two open slits. One of two patterns will appear on the screen. If most of the entities hitting the screen collect directly across from the slits, the entity in question is a particle. On the other hand, if a distinctive pattern with alternating bands of intensity appears on the screen, the entity, in, the entity in question is a wave. Note that the pattern of alternating bands or diffraction pattern is similar to the wave pattern formed by overlapping disturbances when two stones are dropped simultaneously into a pond at a small distance from one another. In summary, my device the two-slit apparatus gives a surefire method of distinguishing waves from particles. In this way, it is possible to characterize all of nature as belonging to one kind or another. <laughs> Some audience members clap when Mr. Young has finished. Others... <laughs> I know which, where you are in the diffraction pattern. Others have already left in frustration and asked for a refund of the ticket price. <laughs> Someone notices that the remaining audience members form a band of a, a, pattern, a pattern of bands radiating outwards from the stage. Interested in this phenomenon, one person raises her hand, but Mr. Young has already disappeared. An explosive end to the great friendship 
of two of the 20th century's greatest scientists, Werner Heisenberg and Niels Bohr, authors of the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics. Why did Heisenberg go to Copenhagen in the midst of the war to see his old friend Niels Bohr? Did Heisenberg hope to find out what Bohr knew about the Allied bomb project? Did he come to warn Bohr about the German project to reassure him that he was doing everything in his power to stall it? Did he want to see if he could persuade Bohr to take advantage of their status as authorities on atomic physics to convince the Axis and allied powers to abandon their efforts to build atomic weapons? Did he hope to gain some important insight from his mentor about physics or ethics or the relationship between the two? Speculation, specularity, spectrality. Science and justice, matter and meaning are not separable ele elements that intersect now and again. They are inextricably fused together and no event, no matter how energetic, can tear them asunder. They cannot be dissociated, not by chemical processing or centrifuge or nuclear blast. Does one, as a physicist, have the moral right to work on the practical exploitation of atomic energy? Heisenberg's haunting question to Bohr hangs in the air throughout Copenhagen, enfolded into the making of space-time, its reverberations returning again for the first time. <clears throat> Space-time coordinates, the apocalypse, 2060 AD or thereafter, Newton's prediction for the end of time, diffracted through 2003, discovery of Newton's 17th century prediction prophecy, diffracted through the 17th century, Newton the prophet, the seer of the future, the inventor of the calculus, the great calculator, the seer of the laws of nature that determine every event for all time kills time for a second time. The end of time. We've heard this before. We hear it all the time. We inherit the future, not just the past. Newton, the natural philosopher, had already done in time. His laws of physics always already make this pronouncement. In a deterministic universe, there is no time. All events have already happened. Time doesn't exist. The future has already happened. And yet, the great calculator makes a prediction to end all predictions. Newton, the theologian, the scholar of biblical prophecy, calculates the end of time, his prediction hidden away for a time not his own. Biblical prophecy and natural philosophy each engages in predictions. One prediction for the end of time is uncertain. It may end later. The other leaving absolutely no room for uncertainty, not a hair's breadth. Biblical prophecy was surely more than an avocation for Newton. It was an invocation of spirits discontinuous with his natural philosophy. Spirits took center stage in his natural philosophy, but not his theology. For Newton, they were everything and nothing. The ether filling all space, then banished, appearing and disappearing. Spirits have a peculiar presence absence throughout his work, a vanishing presence, a reappearing absence, forever returning, coming from the future as well as the past. Stage right. The lights go up on the house and reveal the ghosts of Einstein and Bohr pushing away from the craps table where Einstein, with unchecked disdain in his voice, reports that some physicists claim they saw God playing there. <laughs> Einstein has had enough. They mosey on over to another table and quickly fall into the groove of an old conversation. The table in front of them sports a two-slit apparatus at the very center of their imaginations. They are performing gedanken, or thought experiments, with the two-slit apparatus. The stakes? Nothing less than the nature of reality. Bohr insists that using a two-slit apparatus, he can show that with one arrangement of the two-slit apparatus, 
Light, or even atoms, or electrons, behave as waves. And with a complementary arrangement, these entities behave as particles. He explains that entities are not inherently wave or particle, and that it is possible, whoops, and that it is possible to produce waves and particle behaviors when the entity in question interacts with the appropriate apparatus, where interaction contra interaction does not presume the existence of independent entities. Einstein is losing his patience. He picks up a large stack of chips, neatly arranges them in his hand, and confidently places them on the table. Bohr says he will bet against Einstein, but he keeps talking without laying down any determinate number of chips in any particular spot. <laughs> Bohr's exuberance is hard to contain as he explains that Einstein's witch slit experiment beautifully demonstrates his principle of complementarity, according to which an entity either behaves like a wave or like a particle, depending on how it is measured. Einstein's reverie is broken by this last comment. Exasperated, he asks. So what you are saying is that the very nature of the entity, its ontology changes with the experimental apparatus used to determine its nature? Or worse, that nothing is there before it is measured, as if measurements conjure things into existence? Newton, the great natural philosopher, the first modern scientist, the greatest scientist of all time, the inventor of the calculus. Newton, the theologian, the devoted student of biblical prophecy, a devout non-Trinitarian Christian. Newton, the chosen one, the reader of the great clockwork, the one who stopped time, the prophet who could see the end of time. Newton the great empiricist, the great positivist, the great determinist, the great mechanist. All these honorifics left hanging as questions, all coexisting along with other ghosts of Newton that speak of the undoings of mechanism, determinism, positivism, scientism. Superpositions, not oppositions. Physics has always been spooked. <clears throat> Space-time coordinates, untimely, no given time, no given space. The concern is not with horizons of modified past or future presence, but with a past that has never been present and which never will be, whose future to come will never be a production or a reproduction in the form of presence. Physicists now claim to have empirical evidence that it is possible not only to change the past, but to change the very nature of being itself in the past. Tunneling from the realm of imagination to the empirical world, from the laboratory of the mind to the laboratory of hard facts, from the 1930s to the 1990s, the two-slit apparatus at the center of the Bohr-Einstein debate is made flesh. New technological advances make it possible to actually do this great thought experiment in the lab. But much more than technological innovation is at issue. The way in which this experiment is designed is remarkable for its imaginative ingenuity as well. For this experiment is engineered to empirically test a difference in the metaphysical views of Bohr and Heisenberg experimental metaphysics, empirical marks from the world beyond, a ghostly matter, the line between physics and metaphysics is undecidable, indeterminate. Heisenberg understands measurements as disturbances that place a limit on knowability. That is, measurements entail epistemic uncertainties, Whereas for Bohr, the measurement is about the conditions for the possibility of semantic and ontic determination, that is, ontological indeterminacy. So the disagreement between Bohr and Heisenberg has to do with what exists in the absence of a measurement. Are there or are there not objects with inherent boundaries and characteristics before a measurement takes place? To be or not to be? 
But how can one even begin to contemplate an experiment that tests what exists before a measurement takes place when the very act of experimenting always already entails measurement? It turns out that there is a way to empirically test which, if either of the metaphysical views of Bohr and Heisenberg has empirical support. The basic idea behind this ingeniously designed experiment is the following. The key is to use the inner workings of the atom, that is what physicists call the internal degrees of freedom, to leave behind a telltale sign of which slit the atom passes through in a way that does not disturb its forward momentum, what physicists call the external degrees of freedom. So to, just to give you a, a, an everyday example between internal and external degrees of freedom, you might think about um, drive, pay attention to this part. It's about mothering. Driving down, <laughs> driving, driving in the car, right? And your kids are throwing things all over the place. Like that's messing with the internal degrees of the freedom. But if you have good enough concentration and you get to the point where you can ignore all that stuff, you can still go at 65 miles an hour. <laughs> okay. So. So in particular, the experiment is designed in just such a way that an atomic electron is made to jump from a higher energy state to a lower energy level at just the right moment using a laser to excite the electron and thereby tinker tinkering only with the atom's internal degrees of freedom such that it leaves a telltale photon behind in one of the two cavities or containers that are placed adjacent to each of the two slits while the atom continues on its way unaffected by the event. Okay, so there's uh, this uh, beam of atoms that's coming through, okay, and then there's a laser beam which excites the electron of the atom up to a higher energy level, and then there are cavities, which I'm just noticing with the lights on are really hard to see, but there are cavities there where it says cavity one and cavity two, they're just in light gray. And when it goes into one of these cavities, it will definitely decay with 100% probability from the higher energy level down to some lower energy level and leave behind a telltale photon. The atom is like just going along at 65 miles an hour though and it just goes through one slit or the other. So in this way you can do a witch slit uh, experiment without actually disturbing the atom. So the result, the result. Unambiguous confirmation of Bohr's point of view. In the absence of a witch slit detector, the atom behaves like a wave. When a witch slit detector is introduced, the pattern does indeed change from a diffraction pattern to a scatter pattern, from wave behavior to particle behavior, and crucially, this shift by design is not a result of a disturbance. This finding goes against both Heisenberg and Bohr's understanding, I'm sorry, both Heisenberg and Einstein's understandings and strongly confer, confirms Bohr's point of view for it can be shown that the shift in pattern is the result actually of the entanglement of the object and the agencies of observation. That is, there is empirical evidence for Bohr's performative understanding of identity. Identity is not inherent. Entities are not inherently either a wave or a particle, but rather it is performed differently given different experimental circumstances. Now given the performative nature of identity, things get even more interesting. For if Bohr's hypothesis that phenomena are quantum entanglements of objects and agencies of observation holds, then some other clearly impossible things become possible. Suppose that the witch slit detector is modified in such a way that the evidence of which slit the atom goes through, the existence of that telltale photon in one container of the, or the other, can be erased after the atom has already gone through one of the slits. I can explain more about this in the Q&A if you want. So it turns out that if the witch slit information is erased, that is, if any trace of which slit it went through is destroyed and the question of which slit is once again undecidable, then a diffraction pattern 
characteristic of waves is once again in evidence, as in the case with a witch slit detector. This result is remarkable, but there's more. It turns out that it doesn't matter at what point the information is erased. In particular, it could be erased after any given atom has already gone through the entire apparatus and made its mark on the screen, thereby contributing to the formation of the overall pattern. This result is nothing less than spectacular. What this experiment tells us is that whether or not an entity goes through the apparatus as a wave or a particle can be determined after it has already gone through the apparatus, that is, after it has already gone through as either a wave, that is, through both slits at once, or as a particle, that is, through one slit or the other. In other words, it is not merely that the past behavior of some given entity has been changed, as it were, but that the entity's very identity has been changed in the past. That is, any entity's past identity, its ontology is never fixed. It is always open to future reworkings. The physicists who propose the quantum eraser experiment interpret these results as the possibility of changing the past. They speak of the diffraction pattern as having been recovered, as if the original pattern has returned and the witch slit information having been erased, hence its name. But this interpretation is based upon the assumptions that are being called into question by this very experiment, assumptions concerning the nature of being and time. If one assumes a metaphysics of presence, that the patterns obtained result from the behavior of a group of individually determinate objects, then it seems inexplicable that the erasure of information of which slit each entity went through after the individuals have gone through the slits could have any effect. Otherwise, what notion of causality could account for such a strange occurrence? What could be the source of such instantaneous communication a kind of global conspiracy of individual actors acting in concert. What kind of spooky action at a distance causality is this? The difficulty here is in the mistaken assumption of a classical ontology based on the belief that individuals, determinate, individual determinately bounded and propertied objects are the actors on this stage. And the stage itself is the givenness of a container called space and a linear sequence of moments called time. But the evidence indicates that the world does not operate according to any such classical ontology, an ontology exorcised of ghosts. On the contrary, Derrida, forgive me. This is empirical evidence for Derrida's ontology. <laughs> I'm sure he's turning over in his grave, but that's OK. As Derrida makes clear, we have to learn to live with ghosts and be accountable to them. It's not that in erasing the information after the fact that the experimenter changes a past that has already been present. Rather, the point is, is that the past was not simply there to begin with, and the future is not simply what will unfold. The past and the future are iteratively reworked and enfolded through the iterative practices of space-time mattering, including conducting witch-slit measurements and then subsequently erasing the witch-slit information. All are one phenomenon. There is no conspiracy at work among individual particles separated in space or individual events separated in time. Space and time are phenomenal, that is, they are interactively configured and reconfigured in the ongoing materialization of phenomena. Neither space nor time exist as determinant givens, as universals outside of matter. Matter does not reside in space and move through time. Space and time are matter's agential performances. Furthermore, the evidence is against the claim made by some physicists that all trace of the evidence of the event is erased when the witch slit information is destroyed, and that the previous diffraction uh, pattern is recovered. On the contrary, the diffraction pattern uh, produced is not the same as the original. 
Unlike the original, the new diffraction pattern is not plainly evident without explicitly tracing the extant entanglements. That is, the trace of all measurements remains even when the information is erased. It takes work to make the ghostly entanglements visible. The past is not closed. It never was. But erasure of all traces is not what is at issue. Even attempts to erase traces leave traces. This, too, is part of the phenomenon. The past is not present. Past and future are iteratively reconfigured and enfolded through the world's ongoing interactivity. There is no inherently determinate relationship between past and future. Phenomena are not located in space and time. Rather, phenomena are material entanglements enfolded and threaded through, threaded through the space-time mattering of the universe. Even the return of a diffraction pattern does not signal a going back an erasure of memory, a restoration of a past present, of a present past. Memory, the pattern of sedimented enfoldings of iterative interactivity, is written into the fabric of the world. The world holds the memory of all traces, or rather, the world is its memory, the enfolded materialization. What does it mean to follow a ghost, to trace entanglements? What seems to be out in front, the future, comes back in advance from the past, from the back. Only by facing the ghosts and their materiality and acknowledging injustice without the empty promise of complete repair, of making amends finally, can we begin to move towards justice. The past is never closed, never finished once and for all, but there is no taking it back, setting time aright, putting the world back on its axis. There is no erasure, finally. The trace of all reconfigurings is written into the world's enfolded materializations. Time can't be fixed. There is no inheritance without a call to responsibility. The being of what we are is, first of all, inheritance. Entanglements are not intertwinings of separate entities, but rather irreducible relations of responsibility. Entanglements are specific material relations of the ongoing differentiating of the world. Matter is never one. It is dispersed, diffracted across spaces and times. Inheritance is never a given. It is always a task. It remains before us. What does it mean to follow a ghost, to trace entanglements? To address the past, to speak with ghosts, is not merely to entertain or reconstruct some narrative of the way it was, but to respond, to be responsible, to take responsibility for that which we inherit, for the entangled relationalities of inheritance that we are, to put oneself at risk, to recognize the dispersion of the self, the diffractions of being in time, to open oneself up to indeterminacy and moving towards what is to come. Only in this ongoing responsibility to the entangled others, without dismissal, without enough already, only in putting in the hard work of tracing entanglements is there the possibility of justice to come. No justice seems possible or thinkable without the principle of some responsibility beyond all living present within that which disjoins the living present before the ghosts of those who are not yet born or who are already dead. Entanglements are relations of obligation, being bound to the other, enfolded traces of othering. Othering, the constitution of an other, entails an indebtedness to the other who is irreducibly and materially bound to and threaded through the self, a diffraction, dispersion of identity. Without this non-contemporaneity, with I'm sorry, wasn't supposed to go. Without this non-contemporaneity with itself of the living present, without this responsibility and this respect for justice concerning those who are not there, of those who are no longer or who are not yet present and living, what sense would there be to ask the question, where, where tomorrow, whither? The very nature of matter entails an exposure to the other. 
Responsibility is not an obligation that the subject chooses, but rather an incarnate relation that precedes the intentionality of consciousness. Responsibility is not a calculation to be performed. It is a relation always already integral to the world's ongoing interactive becoming and not becoming. It is an iterative reopening up to an enabling of responsiveness, not through the realization of some existing possibility, but through the iterative reworking of impossibility and ongoing rupture, a cross-cutting of topological reconfiguring of the space of responsibility. Just does, does justice come simply to repair injustice or more precisely to re-articulate as must be the disjointure of the present time? As the quantum erasure experiment shows, it is not the case that the past, a past that is given, can be changed, contrary to what some physicists have said, or that the effects of past actions can be erased, but that the past is always already open to change. There can never be a final redemption, but space-time mattering can be productively reconfigured as impossibilities are reworked. Reconfigurings don't erase marks on bodies. The sedimented material effects of these very reconfigurings, memories, rememberings, are written into the materiality of the world. Our debt to those who are already dead and those not bo yet born cannot be disentangled from who we are. What if we were to recognize that differentiating is a material act that is not about radical separation, but on the contrary about making connections and commitments, cutting together apart, one move. Let's return to the end. Let's return to this disjointer, the quantum discontinuity this discontinuity that queers our presumptions of continuity is neither the opposite of the continuous nor continuous with it. Quantum leaps are not mere displacements in space through time, not from here now to there then, not when it is the rupture itself that helps constitute the here's and now's and not once and for all. The point is not merely that something is here now and there then without having ever been anywhere in between. It's that here, now, there, then, have become unmoored. There's no given place or time for them to be. Where and when do quantum leaps happen? Furthermore, if the nature of causality is troubled to such a degree that effect does not simply follow cause end over end in an unfolding of existence through time, if there is, in fact, no before and after by which to order cause and effect, has causality been arrested in its tracks? This strange quantum causality entails the disruption of discontinuity continuity, a disruption so destabilizing, so downright dizzying, that it is difficult to believe that it is that which makes for the stability of existence itself. Or rather, to put it a bit more precisely, if the indeterminate nature of existence by its nature teeters on the cusp of stability and instability, of possibility and impossibility, then the dynamic relationality between continuity and discontinuity is crucial to the open-ended becoming of the world, which resists a causality as much as determinism. I don't want to make too much of a little thing. <laughs> but the quantum, this tiny disjuncture that exists in neither space nor time, torques the very nature of the relation between continuity and discontinuity to such a degree that the nature of change changes with each interaction. Change is a dynamism that operates at an entirely different level of existence from that of postulated brute matter situated in space and time. Rather, what comes to be and is immediately reconfigured entails an iterative, interactive becoming of space-time mattering. Quantum discontinuity is the undoing, even undoing itself as well as the notion of itself. Even its appellation, quantum discontinuity, is at once redundant and contradictory. Quantum, a smallest unit, a discontinuous bit of discontinuity, quantum discontinuity. Each designation marking a disruption, disrupting the other, disrupting us stopping short and moving on, a rupture of the discontinuous, a disrupted disruption, 
a stutter? The reiteration, not of what comes before or after, but a disruption of before after, a cut that is itself cross-cut, a passable impassibility, an irresolvable internal contradiction, a logical disjunction, an impasse from the Latin aporia, but one that can contain that which it would hold back. Poricity is not necessary for quantum tunneling, a specifically quantum event, a means of getting through without getting over, without burrowing through. Quantum tunneling makes mincemeat of closure. No holes are needed. Cutting together apart. Take out your quantum scissors. Identity will never be the same. It never was. <laughs> Identity undone by a discontinuity at the heart of matter itself. What spooky matter is this, this quantum discontinuity? Thank you. Thank you.